welcome everyone to the Oxford Institute for Ethics and AI. This is our very first event for the academic year, which is going to be a hybrid event, partly with an audience that's present here in person and also with an online audience. And our topic for this evening is the right to free expression on social media. And I'm absolutely delighted to welcome our main speaker, who is Professor Jamal Green. He is the Dwight Professor of Law at Columbia Law School. He is a scholar of constitutional law and importantly, I guess, for today's um, event, co-chair of Facebook's Oversight Board. He is the author of this fantastic book, How Rights Went Wrong, Why Our Obsession with Rights is Tearing America Apart. Um, really excellent book that makes some important and stimulating contributions to the theory of rights, the doctrine of constitutional rights, and is incredibly beautifully written. I think the description, that hair-raising description of uh, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes is worth the price of admission in itself. But just to put you in the scene a little bit, because I think it might be relevant to what Jamal will talk about today, there are two broad theses, I think, in this book. The first is that the American approach to constitutional rights adjudication is too rigid. It draws sharp contrast between what is a right, what is not a right. It tends to view rights as rather unnuanced. Speech, for example, has to be protected. And it accords these rights excessive force in relation to other sorts of considerations. In the book, Professor Green argues there's a better approach, the proportionality doctrine that is popular in Europe and elsewhere, that tends to view rights in a kind of de-escalated way. There are more of them, but there are also more conflicts amongst them. The second thesis that um, is advanced in the book is that we should stop thinking of rights as excessively the possession of judiciaries. We should democratize the process of figuring out what rights we have and how to balance them against each other. And that's kind of complementary with the first thesis, which is to de-escalate the discourse of rights. So, highly recommend this book, and I'm very excited to see how Jamal will play out the general view he's developed here in relation to this very important topic of freedom of speech in social media. I want now also to introduce uh, two fantastic commentators. One is uh, Baroness Honora O'Neill, who is a leading moral and political philosopher, former president of the British Academy. She's written on many topics, including most saliently for tonight, on rights and the ethics of free speech, and she too is a well-known critic of rights discourse, though from a rather different angle than Jamal. And our second commentator is Professor Timothy Endicott, who is the Vinerian Professor of English Law at Oxford University. Timothy has written extensively on constitutional and administrative law and on the philosophy of law. And I'm very delighted he's able to join us, especially joining us at very short notice because um, Philippa Webb, who was meant to be the other commentator, was unfortunately unable to attend. So as I mentioned before, this is a hybrid event. There'll be an opportunity for questions um, at the end of the panel discussion. But now let me invite Jamal to give us his talk. Thanks, Jamal. Thank you, John. Uh, thanks to all of you for uh, joining this uh, first live session, um, which is uh, very exciting to be part of. Uh, it's really an honor uh, to be here. This is my first trip to, to Oxford, and um, uh, I hope it doesn't feel like surgery, um, <laughs> notwithstanding where we are. Uh, and also thanks, of course, to uh, uh, Professor Endicott and Baroness O'Neill for your comments in advance. Now. Uh, John can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I suspect I've been invited for two reasons, um, and they're different. Uh, I'm going to try to marry them um, in ways that I've not done before, um, at least not publicly and not uh, explicitly. And the first has to do with this book that I wrote earlier, got published earlier this year, uh, How Rights Went Wrong. Uh, as John says, the, the basic argument of the book is that lawyers and citizens in the United States tend to approach rights conflict in ways that essentialize rights, that understand rights in presumptively absolute terms. In part for these reasons, they also tend to judicialize uh, rights, uh, and that these tendencies tend to distort 
our understanding of justice. Uh, they tend to deny our political discourse the resources to sort out uh, conflicts of rights uh, and that in various ways they tend to exacerbate uh, political polarization. And I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, readers and reviewers have found these arguments interesting, um, not as interesting as I find them in the nature of things, but um, interesting enough. Uh, the second reason uh, I think for the invitation is the, the non-academic uh, hat that I wear as co-chair of uh, the Oversight Board, which is a body that uh, independently reviews content moderation decisions made uh, by Facebook, also uh, makes certain recommendations to, to Facebook. Uh, so the decisions on individual cases are binding uh, and the board makes content, uh, makes um, uh, policy recommendations uh, to Facebook. Uh, those are not binding on Facebook, but they have to respond to them. Now, of course, Facebook has been in the news uh, recently, uh, as they often are. Um, if you followed the, the latest news at all, and in fact, they're making news right now, I think, uh, I think um, maybe even as we speak, I think Mark Zuckerberg is on Capitol Hill right now. Um, uh, you know that part of the reason for them being in the news is that they are, again, uh, faced with the accusation that the use of automation uh, to promote uh, content and to generate user engagement has destructive social consequences. Now, uh, the process, these sort of algorithmic and auto automation processes that Facebook um, uh, engages in, as, as well as other social media platforms, don't overlap perfectly with the jurisdiction and the remit of the Oversight Board, uh, but they are certainly of interest to uh, the work of the board, uh, and I think to the work of the Institute as well. Now, as I said, I want to marry um, some observations about rights with some comments that are relevant to uh, the work of the board, and I'm going to do that from, a, from an unusual perspective, at least um, one that's unusual for me, which is namely a hypothetical. Uh, perspective. Uh, I want to draw a, a subtle distinction that I think, notwithstanding being a subtle distinction, turns out to be important in how we frame the regulation of content on social media. It is, it's common in the circles in which I now find myself to think about how the law would treat social media platforms if they were state actors, if they were governments. Uh, in the United States, there are frequent claims that social media sites restrict content in ways that would be illegal uh, or unconstitutional uh, or in violation of, of human rights law for a government to restrict content. Um, again, at times there have been analogous kinds of claims made by uh, international human rights lawyers about the ways in which content restrictions on social media uh, are inconsistent with, or if they were done by a government, would be inconsistent with the protections of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. I, I want to resist those conclusions, uh, or at least the most simple-minded version uh, of those conclusions, uh, and to motivate my thinking about, uh, about this, I want to reframe the question um, from asking what regulations would be permissible if social media companies were governments, and, and asking instead what regulation would be permissible if governments ran competitive social media platforms. Now, the distinction I've just made is very subtle. Um, as, a, as noted, in fact, the questions are the same question um, formally. Uh, but I think the frame matters, uh, and, and that's because I think the shift in frame forces us to think not just about the rights of users and of, of social media uh, and compare them to the rights at stake when governments paradigmatically act against individuals, but instead to start the inquiry by thinking about the purposes and distinctive structure of social media platforms. The shift in frame, I, I, I want to argue, forces us to think not just of when individual rights trump government action, but to keep in mind what the state is trying to accomplish when it regulates speech in a particular setting. The shift in frame, I hope, helps us to think about rights conflicts, not just in terms of what pathologies are committed by the regulator, but also in terms of what effective governance requires. <clears throat> 
a government setting up a social media platform, which is not something governments generally do, is engaged in an activity that is not paradigmatic of the government activity that motivates the First Amendment or that motivates the international human rights regime. How much should that matter is the question that I'm trying to, to answer. How much should it matter that that's not the paradigm case? And the question's not just a thought experiment. Facebook uh, and other social media companies have committed themselves to being guided by the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. The oversight board on which I sit is charged with trying to reconcile that commitment with Facebook's uh, content practices. It's conceivable that other platforms, not just Facebook, might pursue analogous uh, projects in uh, self-governance, uh, something analogous to the oversight board. Twitter has repeatedly been in the middle of lawsuits over the behavior of politicians uh, who, on the platform and how, how and to what degree they're permitted to uh, block or restrict the access of, uh, of users. There are proposals uh, from people like Ethan Zuckerman at uh, MIT uh, to build what he's called a digital public infrastructure. Um, even if those kinds of proposals don't necessarily involve uh, government largesse, they do require the building out of principles of public law to govern the social media space. Now, because this is not a US audience, uh, I will not linger as long as I might otherwise in the weeds of how exactly to answer the question of what would happen if the government were to set up a competitive social media platform under the domestic constitutional law of, of the United States, First Amendment law. Uh, but I will make a few um, general observations, and I'm happy to talk more about, about it in the Q&A. Because the First Amendment is both um, very old and very demanding, there is a mature network of frameworks for thinking about free expression regulation in the context of government institutions that are providing forums for speech rather than regulating and punishing the primary conduct of individuals. Uh, I'll mention just two of those frameworks. There are more than two, but I'll mention just two of them um, just to illustrate a lingering problem in how US lawyers tend to think about these issues. The first framework is known to US lawyers as public forum doctrine. Uh, public forum doctrine arises out of the recognition that there are forms of government property that are opened up for free expression, um, sometimes uh, selectively, and that distinctive rules are required uh, under these circumstances. So for example, if the government runs a town hall meeting um, or if it allows certain forms of free expression on a military base, what forms of discrimination between speakers um, or what kinds of discrimination in the content of speech uh, might be permissible under those circumstances? And the answer is that generally, generally speaking, uh, as a formal matter, uh, courts have come to the view that so-called viewpoint discrimination, discrimination between speakers or uh, between speech on the basis of the viewpoint that it expresses, is almost never permitted, um, uh, even, on, even in a public forum. Uh, and content discrimination, discrimination between different kinds of uh, speech about different subjects, um, different subject matter, is permitted only if the forum has ex ante been limited to particular topics, right? So you can engage in, the government can engage in content discrimination within a, within a public forum, uh, a limited public forum it would be the, the terminology, but it can't do so extemporaneously. It can't do it on the fly. It has to limit the, the, the public forum in advance. One of the key cases, just to focus your minds on what kind of issue this, this is, one of the key cases in this line of decisions involved a public auditorium in Chattanooga, Tennessee that, that was leased out for private events. Um, a theater group wanted to put on a production of Hair, uh, the musical, uh, which includes um, scenes with nudity and with some sexual um, themes, and the city denied their application. They said this is not appropriate for this public theater. Supreme Court gets the case and says, um, that this kind of, of content discrimination was not permitted unless it could be shown that the content was not just racy or subversive, but was in fact obscene, uh, where the standard for obscenity is a very high standard, um, generally requiring um, a highly graphic pornography 
um, that has no purpose beyond sexual gratification. Now, this would seem to be a very demanding standard um, for a social media, uh, for regulation of, of social media. Um, but there's a second framework um, that we might also think is relevant uh, to this uh, context. In 2015, the US Supreme Court heard a case involving a Texas Department of Motor Vehicles program in which automobile owners could suggest logos and phrases to be placed on their license plates. A wide range, you can already see the problem, right? a wide range of applications uh, were readily approved, um, rather be golfing, um, a celebration of, of, of the NASCAR driver, Jeff Gordon, uh, Oklahoma Sooners logo, and this is Texas, by the way, this is gonna be relevant. Um, Texas and Oklahoma are rivals, um, but they approve that if you wanna be a fan of the Oklahoma Sooners. Uh, but then the Sons of Confederate Veterans uh, applied for their own license plates, um, which included a depiction of the flag of the, of the Confederacy, the Confederate States of America, the rogue nation um, formed to preserve the institution of slavery. Texas Motor Vehicle Department rejects the application, right? And then the Sons of Confederate Veterans claim a violation of their First Amendment rights. Now, if Texas had made its license plates into a limited or designated public forum, um, public forum doctrine in the US, like the Chattanooga Movie Theater had made its a theater into a so-called designated public forum, it would have lost the case uh, because it was plainly engaged in discrimination on the basis of viewpoint. But Texas won the case. Um, instead of saying that this was a kind of public forum, the Supreme Court instead said that Texas was engaged in government speech. Now, because the government needs to have uh, the freedom to express its own viewpoint, the Supreme Court has never identified any constitutional limitation on government speech. So this means that in theory, Texas could screen its license plates uh, however it wanted to. Now, taken together, Right, this line of cases suggests that if a government forum is a so-called public forum, or I'll say a, a limited or a designated public forum, there are very severe limits on how speech can be restricted on that forum. But if a government forum is government speech, then there are almost no limits, maybe none at all. I think there probably are some, but none has ever been articulated on how the government may restrict speech in that context. Whether a forum is a public forum or is government speech can be a very subtle inquiry. Going into those two cases, it's not at all clear which is which. But the consequence of the decision is massive. It's, it's discontinuous. And indeed, I think in the Texas case, I think the consequences of choosing the public forum category over the government speech category would have been so drastic, swastikas would have had to be allowed on license plates, that one suspects that fear of consequences is what leads the court to the, the very curious conclusion that Texas itself was speaking through its citizens' choice of license plate, rather be golfing, is Texas is government speech. Now, I'm gonna return in a minute to, to what this means for the status of hypothetical public social media platform. But in the meantime, what does international human rights law have to say about a hypothetical social media platform? The answer, so far as I can tell, is very little, uh, or at least very little with any clarity. The, uh, international Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and authoritative, authoritative statements that have been made about it um, is where one would most naturally look for guidance on government speech restrictions. Uh, Article 19 of the ICCPR allows for certain speech restrictions when, among other things, uh, necessity and proportionality are satisfied. Now, in theory, um, application of proportionality analysis enables the international human rights regime to avoid the kind of perplexing discontinuities that we see between public forum and government speech doctrine in the United States under First Amendment law. But there are a couple of important differences between platform governance and the kinds of conflicts that have historically generated human rights responses. First is the fact that the content moderation um, we're most often talking about is removal of particular pieces of content as being the, the only kind of penalty we're talking about. This is quite different from detention um, of an individual or other coercive remedies. Now, proportionality analysis presumably should account for that difference and, and does and would account for that difference. Uh, second, second important difference um, between traditional 
um, subjects of international human rights law and content governance is the scale of content governance on the internet, which enables the harms of ordinary speech to spread in ways that have not historically been even possible. Now, this again should be relevant to proportionality analysis, but the relative immaturity of international human rights jurisprudence as applied to government-provided platforms means that there's just not that much existing um, guidance on how proportionality would apply in this context or should apply. It's very open. Uh, so when we move from the hypothetical public platform context to back to the real context of private platforms, the problem of translation of the existing norms becomes even more complicated, um, even if we're applying norms that are generated from the public context. That's because private platforms have, or at least I think should be understood to have, their own set of expressive interests. Uh, Parler's interest in allowing more expression than Facebook is not just a pure financial interest. It's also an, it's also an expressive interest. It has expre that interest has expressive content that any regulatory regime should account for. A version of that interest shows up in public forum and government speech doctrine as well. Right? The law recognizes that the platform operator has a right to express itself through the content limits it places on the platform. Now, in the United States, the categorical instincts of American constitutional law mean that the decision maker has to choose either the expressive interest of the user as being the most important thing, that's public forum doctrine, or has to choose that the expressive interest of the host is the most important thing, that's government speech doctrine. You, it's just not, it's not integrated into a single regime. It's, it's one or the other, and they're discontinuous. In my view, these cross-cutting legal norms make it, in fact, unintelligible to measure platform rules by the content, or by the, the, the quantity, excuse me, by the quantity of the speech that they allow. I think it's better to measure those rules by their consistency, by their transparency, by their susceptibility to abusive or arbitrary application, not by how much speech they contribute or don't contribute. Um, the norms around this just cut in different directions. Uh, I'm going to wrap up at least my initial talk, but I, I want to make a broader point um, here. I've tried to show that the question of applying legal norms to content moderation on social media platforms cannot coherently be reduced to a simple act of translation from government regulation of primary conduct to private regulation of platform behavior. There's a broader point to be made about flattening conflicts over rights into applications of the most paradigmatic or pathological possible violations of those rights. In the speech context, if we see all speech restrictions as analogous, even in mitigated form, to criminal sedition prosecutions or purges of one's political enemies, we will misunderstand or mistrust the governance aims associated with most speech restrictions, not just with marginal ones. We must instead, I think, understand rights conflicts as the ordinary byproduct of committing ourselves to a genuinely pluralistic social and political life. This means that those conflicts are less an opportunity for scolding or for the rending of tunics, right? But are rather invitations to more creative forms of collective governance. Thank you, and I'll take the comments. I'm probably the wrong commentator. I'm probably the wrong commentator because uh, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a US lawyer, and I'm not uh, competent to say anything useful about the detail of American constitutional law. What I have thought about a bit is uh, the question of rights, and in particular rights to freedom of expression, or expressive rights, as Jamal uh, phrases it, which I think is quite a useful phrase. Um, and of course, I've thought, we all have thought about the harm that can be done by speech that's seen as exercising this right. The harms of great variety, 
um, fraud, fake news, conspiracies, vaccine skepticism, and latterly, some of them, not all of them, have been inflicted by uses of social media, with results ranging from promoting anorexia to damaging individual reputations to corrupting democracy. We've seen a huge range. And they've produced a wide range of counteraction. And I agree that this is partly due to the sheer absence of platform moderation that works or relatively on relative, these or relatively detailed matters, but I suspect that it has more fundamental sources, and I'm going to suggest that those sources lie in our focus on freedom of expression. Strikingly, some of the most vociferous contemporary advocates of rights to freedom of expression aren't much moved by this, these concerns. I'm extraordinarily indifferent. As they see it, freedom of expression is a right that demands extensive not complete, but very extensive protection for speech, even if it is, for example, false, misleading, provocative, insulting, even if it harms. So how did we get to this position where we have an interpretation, an understanding, a widespread understanding of uh, th uh, th that traditional views that speech that is false, misleading, provocative, or insulting should limit rights to freedom of expression? Is that view simply mistaken? Does a right to freedom of expression protect highly unacceptable speech acts or not? I think that is the question at the basis here. So I'm going, in fact, to bracket the raging contemporary disagreements about the justification of rights, which often represent the basic issues as a choice between moral and political approaches. I think of Adam Edinson's book. I hope that what I shall try to say will be relevant to rights, whether seen as the creatures of international instruments, uh, Universal Declaration, European Convention, etc., to rights seen as ag anchored in state constitutions, for example, the US Constitution, and to rights seen as moral claims that depend neither on states nor on other enactments. I'm not going to bracket issues about the interpret so I'm going to bracket issues about the interpretation of rights of various sorts. I greatly enjoy Jamal's comments and discussions of judgment and of the history of the cultural specificity of US um, interpretation of rights. It was refreshing. Instead, I begin by reminding you of the older and wider traditions from which accounts of rights of all these times emerged. Those traditions treated duties as more fundamental than rights. They started from the agent's question, what ought I or we do, rather than the recipient's or claimant's question, what am I entitled to, or what ought I receive, or what ought I get? Accounts of rights, by contrast, give priority to right holders and their claims against others. If rights and duties were always reciprocal, this wouldn't matter at all, but they're not. And the choice of perspective has deep implications, whichever views we take of the justification of rights claims, of which rights there are, and of questions about interpretation. Unsurprisingly, once we've prioritised the recipient's question, we have to ignore duties that lack counterpart rights. This is often seen as merely, I put that in scare quotes, merely a matter of bracketing what used to be called imperfect duties, duties that are not claimable because their performance is discretionary. For example, duties of generosity are imperfect duties, not because they don't matter, but because the choice of recipient is at the discretion of the agent. We cannot be generous to all others and there are no rights to others' generosity. I think that point's correct. However, Imperfect duties aren't the only duties that are overlooked when rights rather than duties are given priority. There are also perfect, that is to say, non-discretionary duties that lack counterpart rights. Traditional examples of such non-discretionary duties include many duties that bear on communication, such as honesty, aiming for accuracy, civility and decency. Here there are no claimants. Since speech is not required, silence or discretion are often permissible. Of course, even if there are no claimants, communication, including communication that relies on social media, must evidently reach recipients. I'm not questioning that, on the contrary. 
So as I see it, the 20th century shift from discussion of freedom of speech to discussion of freedom of expression has been basic to this change. And you may say it's not been a shift, it's just been an assimilation. I think I understand why the shift seemed useful, indeed necessary to lots of people. Referring only to freedom of speech can seem too specific, misleading, given that communication has come to rely not only on the spoken word, but on a widening range of technologies, beginning with writing, printing, broadcasting, film, and now digital technologies. However, substituting concern with freedom of expression for traditional concerns with free speech privileges the originator and ignores the recipient. What all communication has in common is that it requires an originator whose claims reach the relevant recipients, but originators' relations to recipients vary. In particular, they may be direct or mediated, and some of the relevant intermediaries may be identifiable and regulated. Think of uh, publishers for printed works. Others not identifiable, indeed anonymous, and not regulated, e.g. data brokers for online communication. Social media, whether provided by commercial or public institutions, are used for communication in which originators, recipients, and intermediaries may be identifiable to some others in some cases, but are not identifiable in others. I suggest that the difficulty that recipients can have in identifying originators and those who seek to control and govern originators plays an important role in securing opportunities for originators to act anonymously and thereby allows those who breach ethical standards, some of them perfect duties that matter for others and matter for effective and acceptable communication, to escape accountability.